Hallelujah. So let me welcome everyone again to our service. If you join us online, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for being part of our service today. Um, my name is Tunia Adisa, and I'm the lead pastor for White Olive Christian Assembly. We pray that God's blessing will locate you. We pray that God will delight in you. And his fullness will be seen at work in your life. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your breath. Receive your life, even as we share your word today. Thank you because there is divine visitation today. To the glory and the praise of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this one I have titled, um, Put Your Gift to Work. Put Your Gift to Work. Last week, um, Pastor George spent some time explaining, you know, the four gift types that he uh, came up with. And then after the message, he ministered to us. So I believe that we have been anointed afresh. My concern is after we have received the grace and the power and the anointing and the impartation, um, that we still go back and sit down. We need to do as God inspires us concerning his kingdom. So that's why I titled this one, Put Your Gift to Work. Luke chapter 19, I read from verse 11. Luke 19, from verse 11 to 27, New King James Version. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God will appear immediately. Verse 12. I'm reading Luke 19 from verse 12. Therefore, he said, so he told them a story. He said, a noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants. How many servants did he call? So underline it there in your Bible, 10 servants. Deliver to them 10 minors and said to them, do business till I come. Do business till I come. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying that we will not have this man to reign over us. Verse 15. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded those servants to whom he had given the money. So we see the minor now is money. Abi? To whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Underline trading. Verse 16, then come the first, saying, Master, your miner has earned ten miners. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Underline faithful in very little. Then have authority over ten cities. Verse 18, and the second one too came, saying, Master, your miner has earned five miners. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your miner, which I have put away in an handkerchief. For I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. And then he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. You wicked servant. Underline wicked servant. You knew that I am an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him. And give it to him who has ten. 
But they said to him, Master, he already has ten. Verse 26. For I said to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 27. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. May the Lord bless his words. So this is an interesting parable that Jesus told to the people. And in my study and research, Jesus was actually talking about a true story, an actual event during his time. So the story goes that there was a guy called Achilles, who was the son of King Herod the Great. When Herod died, the kingdom was divided. So they gave half of the kingdom to Achilles and refused to call him king. So he was hungry and he felt concerned. So he journeyed to Rome to go and talk to um, Caesar. Um, it was not Julius Caesar, one of those Caesars. <laughs> um, to ask, okay, so Caesar Augustus, to ask for the title of the king. And the man said to him, okay, so before he got there, <laughs> Uh, there was a delegation of his family members and some Jews and Samaritans who went through another route to Rome to oppose, you know, his request to become king. And then there was back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, they said um, Caesar gave him the kingdom, gave him the kingship. So he returned. Of course, the guys who opposed him, who were his enemy, should not have returned. <laughs> because when he became king, you know what he means. But there was a twist to the story because Jesus was also talking about himself. He was using his real life situation, actual story, to explain the concept of his kingdom. You know, they call it indirect self-disclosure. When someone tells a story that's actually about themselves, but decided not to reveal it as their own. So in this case, Jesus spoke about a noble person himself and said that the person was going away, was a powerful man, and then called all his servants, ten of his servants, and then gave them minor. So we now know that minor was money, okay? And ask them to do something with it till he returns. I say, whole lot. I think we have discussed this 2022, two years ago, in the midweek service. This story I'm telling you. I'm not sure every, <laughs> many people remember. But we've talked with... We, you remember we did all the parables of Jesus at the midweek service? We had discussed this extensively. But the parable is addressed to two people. Number one, the people who are enemies, who made themselves enemy to the king or to the nobleman. You know, that story is still applicable today. People will oppose the reign of Christ. They will not want Jesus to reign over them. You know, they told um, Pontius Pilate, they said, um, we have no king but Caesar. They didn't want Jesus. And by rejecting Jesus, they also rejected his messiahship. They didn't want him to be king over them. And then they would do anything to frustrate the plans and the purpose of God. So that is a given that people will oppose the reign of God. You know, one of the danger is that sometimes we think that we are not part of the opposition. But you may be, because Jesus said, whoever is not with me is actually against me. You cannot be on the fence. You are either working for God or you are not working for God. It's as simple as that. You can do all your analysis, but <laughs> according to scriptures, um, you, you can't be on the fence. You have to make up your mind where to stand. And if you are not doing it, then you are scattering. That's what Jesus said. He said, you are not gathering with me, then you are scattering. I think it's Matthew chapter 2, verse 20, verse 30. If you are not gathering with me, then you are scattering. 
what I have gathered. So you are either cooperating with God or you are scattering what God is doing. That's the first one. Number two is the story and the focus of our conversation today, which is about his servants. These servants that he gave 10 minus each. Let me, let me say something here. The story, the parable of the 10 minus is not the same thing as the parable of talent. Some people are hearing that for the first time. It's not the same. There are many times Jesus told a story that they look like the same, maybe in Luke, and you see it in Matthew. And then, of course, there's a small twist or maybe a small addition to what he said in Matthew. They are not exactly the same. Oftentimes, we make that mistake and think that they are the same. They are not the same. In other words, Jesus often repeats his stories just to drive home the point, especially he's talking to a different crowd. How did I know? Let me show you a story. Um, Luke chapter 11, verse 11. Luke 11, verse 11. We'll read 11 and 12. Jesus said here, If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him what? Scorpion. How many things? Bread, abi, fish, and then egg. Three things that Jesus mentioned here. Now, let's go into the Matthew edition. Matthew chapter 7, verse 9. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone, abi, bread? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? There was no mention of egg in this case. So they are not the same story. They were different stories that were told at different places, even though Jesus made reference to the same thing. I can preach here today and share one message. I can go to another place and share the same message, but I may change the different examples or different stories that are saying the same message. Is somebody listening now? So the story of the parable of talent is not the same as the parable of the miners. In the parable of the talent, you'll find that in Matthew chapter 25, the Bible says that they were given according to their capacity. And it talked about three people. One was given five, the other was given two, and the last one was given one. And he mentioned that it was according to their abilities. According to their abilities. But in this story, it was not according to abilities. I've been reflecting on this scripture. So it means that God gives according to abilities, but does it mean that God doesn't give based on abilities? He just trusts you and gives you grace and capacity, hoping that you maximize it. You know, there are so many stories that we've heard and many preachings that God gives based on abilities. But I've also seen here. Did you read it here, Abby? He just gave them all, 10 minus each. And then they delivered different levels of results. What does that mean? I came to two conclusions, two possibilities. It could be that we're all being given the same number of hours or a day to invest in the kingdom of God. You came to the kingdom. You have the time to make maximum investment. Okay? You either maximize it through whatever kind of deposit that you're making in God's kingdom. Okay? Not that one person is giving more than the other person. That's number one. Number two possibility is that, could it be that everything God gave you is the best, it's the maximum. That's all that you need. In other words, he, he didn't give you half. He didn't give you quarter. He gave you full measure. How you now maximize it depends on you. Is somebody listening to me? Those are the two possibilities. If you read this story further, you'll find out that the one that was given 10, one was given 10, he doubled. Did you see there? He made another 10, 100% return. But there's another one who, with this 10, he made 50% return. Abi, he's there. Bible only limited the accountability to only three. 
the one who doubled, the one who halved, and the one who did nothing with it. What I'm driving at is they were all given equal measure of opportunities. This is not a story of the talent. But he asked them to do something. Do business till I come. King James Version say, occupy till I come. Some other transition say, trade till I come. Whatever opportunity, whatever name you want to give it. He said, they must do something with that that he has given. Hmm. My first question is, why didn't the masters give specific instruction what they should do with that which he has given them? Why didn't he tell them, you trade in gold, you trade in silver, you trade in bronze? He gave them the liberty to determine what they do with that which he has given them. What am I driving at? Sit down, reflect, and think. See, God has an expectation of you. All this nonsense, I mean, this story that we have been talking and crying and emphasizing. God is expecting something from you. He could be 100%. In fact, let me, let me shock you. It's not even 100%. The minimum he's asking is for interest on the investment he's made in your life. That was what he said to the last guy. He said, the least you could have done is deposit it. That's his expectation. So if that one had deposited at the bank and came back with interest, they would not have condemned him. That was the problem. Hmm. you are left to sort out the details of how you put the grace and the gift and the opportunities God is bringing into your life. Decide how you give, how you invest it and get a return on investment. But God has an expectation. He has an expectation. And the truth is that you'll be held liable you'll be held accountable for how you made that investment in God's kingdom. Is somebody listening to me? So the master entrusted the same amount to each servant and then gave them complete freedom to do whatever they determined individually to invest in his resources. So the grant was a test by the master. And it would be wise to be aware of this test as a child of God. I was saying yesterday to my wife, I said, when God gives you grace and talent and, you know, opportunities, I said it's good that you use it for a company. After all, they pay your salary. Fantastic. Use it for a company. Use it for your organization. Use it for whatever you want to do it for. I said, but don't ever invest everything on an organization because God expects us to hard to his kingdom. Is somebody listening to me? God expects you to... Put some of this investment in God's kingdom. So say to your, part, to your neighbor, do business with God's gift. Put your gift and your grace to work. This is so very, very important. I would say all of us shall give account. All of us shall give account. It's possible that you... Take all the grace and take all the anointing, and you, you don't bother. On, on Thursday, we were rounding up the book of Romans, chapter 16. And Apostle Paul wrote, the first person he mentioned in the book, chapter 16 of Romans, was a woman called Phoebe. In fact, the Bible documents that she was the one who brought the letter Apostle Paul wrote to the people in Rome. A woman, a woman. And then if you read verse 1 to like 5 or 6, he will mention different kind of women who were part of his ministry. Why were they silent all this while? Because if you don't look closely, you will not know that there were a lot of women who were super powerful in the ministry of Apostle Paul. Wow. He, I have been reading the Bible. It did not occur to me until I was studying during the week. But what? Phoebe said, my partner in the Lord. Powerful women. And so if we say it's because of gender, there's no excuse. Because there were people in the early church who were critical in the expansion of God's work. So every Christian has a responsibility to promote God's kingdom. 
I'm going to say it again. You have a responsibility to promote God's kingdom. And you can do it too many means, different means. You can be the one who wants to preach. You can be the one who wants to stay in a particular location. You can be the one who wants to sponsor. You can be the one who, you, you, have, the, you have the liberty to determine how you use the gifts and the grace of God upon your life. But please, don't take the grace and the gift of God for nothing. That's very important. Don't take it for nothing. Um, there's a story I read that got my attention. And it was a story about the man called Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius of Loyola was a Spanish priest in the 16th century, the 1500s and something. And he was said to be in the military. He was a soldier. But he was also a, a man who is sold to carnality. They said he, he likes women. And he wanted to be a fine boy. So one of these days, he had a problem um, when he fought in the war. So he got injured. And he did several surgery so that he could, he could rectify his leg so that he could still be able to charm women. And you know what medical surgery looked like in the 1500s. <laughs> he was not successful. So they said till, for the rest of his life, he had the limp. But while he was sick, they said he came across a book, and that book led to his conversion. Ignatius of Loyola is the man who started the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church. He was a man who started the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church. And his vision was that, I, I, I don't want to be a priest just staying in the monastery. I want to come into the public space. I, I want to take God into the public space. That was what propelled him into that ministry. And he became a powerful ministry. They said by the time he died, there were over a thousand Jesuits, you know, that had been established. In fact, they said today there are over 16,000 Jesuits in 112 countries across the world because of one man's vision in the Catholic Church. So the Jesuits are the people who are responsible for the building of hospitals in the Catholic ministry. They were the one responsible for building churches, I mean, um, schools. They were the one responsible for building orphanages, okay? They were the one who were taking people um, from prostitution and settling them in different, you know, ministries. Helping people and doing all that. And it became a powerful ministry till today. I don't know how many people know, the Lagos Business School is owned by the Catholic Church. The Jesuit order. And only God knows how many. I get um, stories from people in Canada, in the UK, who wants their children, I mean, some of our members who, are, who want their children to go to Catholic schools. They literally took over. There are hospitals here where people do medicals. Um, I remember one, of, one granny, I can't remember, who, whose parent, who went for high check in one of their hospitals to tell you how much investment they made in such ministries. I'm not saying that it has to be through the church. I'm saying that you can start them. It, it, it sometimes is just what it takes. is the passion, is the drive. Once you start, unseen forces will come to our head to help us. And that's the assignment. That's the responsibility. I know that in a few years, we'll have people here who have ministries, you know, impacting thousands and hundreds of lives and hundreds of thousands of lives across the world. Amen. I thought you say amen. amen. Did you remember that in that story? When the man came and asked them to give account, and they said, my Lord, your 10 minus has doubled. Did the man collect the 10 minus from him? He didn't need it. He gave them in the first place. What they got was more than the ten minus. After doubling, the man said, now, he inherit what? Ten kingdoms. You know, Jesus has been talking about kingdoms. In other words, it looks like there's a kingdom that we're going to inherit, or territory that we're going to inherit. So what that means is, I'll be a king in the kingdom. That's why he called himself the king of kings. He has made us kings and priests to our God. So, 
The question is, who are going to be my subject? I don't know. Maybe some of us here. Or maybe some of you will be my king in that kingdom, depending on the investment that we make. Is somebody listening to me? Because he didn't collect it back from them. The one that got 10, he said, take 10 kingdoms. Take your 10, collect your 10, and then take 10 kingdoms. The one that um, only got 50%, he said, take five kingdoms. And the one that he got nothing was taken from him. They did not cast him into outer darkness. If you read that story, he didn't go to hell. It's just that he lost all his life investment that could have made for the kingdom of God. Remember, Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at that scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 12. 1 Corinthians 3, 12. He said, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, a straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, that day, we reveal or we declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what source, of what sort it is. There are ministries now that are very powerful. When they go through the fire, nothing will come out of it. That's what it's about. We say the things that we do now, some of them will not survive. Why? They couldn't pass the test. Apostle Paul says this, okay? If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive reward. If anyone's work is burned, because people's work will be burned, he said what? He will suffer a loss. They will have regrets. He said, but he himself will be saved. So it means that some people will still make heaven, but their works, their investments in the kingdom of God would have been consumed by fire. Put your gift to work. Put your grace to work. Stop trying to survive. L stop limiting the capacities and the possibilities of God in your life. That's what I'm saying. Don't prioritize money. Prioritize God. And watch how he will step on the scene. I can tell you these things because I, I have left many comfort zones in my life. I left civil service. I think civil service is guaranteed. You get monthly return. I mean, sorry, monthly salary. Guaranteed. But it was not enough. It was not fulfilling. I thought I had so much grace. I cannot stay here. That was why I left civil service. Was it easy when I stepped into the business space? It wasn't. It wasn't. But God was taking me on the journey. That was the first move. Because for so many of us here, until you make that first move, you may not find the roadmap to even the end or destination that you are supposed to arrive at. That job is not your life. The work is your life. The job is only a pointer to the work. I don't know how better to, <laughs> to say this story. Hey, when I got into business, it was not palatable. It was tough. It was, but God was taking me somewhere. God was taking me somewhere. I had to shut down the business at some point to step into ministry. Okay, I stepped into ministry. I was super comfortable in this star. <laughs> I was super comfortable. I, I thought that was the end, but that was not the end. God was still taking me on a journey. Some of you will make two moves. Some people will make five moves before to get to their destination. The earlier you start the move, the better for you. That's what I'm saying. If you tried it, it failed. That is not the end of your life. Because you don't understand. You don't. When they started the business, when they started the company, it was, you are not the one in mind. You are only looking for something. When you found it, that's not the end. That's not your destination. That's not the end of your life. You lost a job. Forget it. There are works in the kingdom. The day you make up your mind and settle down, that's the day you find it. I have told you before, when Apostle Paul was fighting the church as at that time, he was going all over the place. Where was he getting sponsorship? Some people were sponsoring him. So till today, if you have a satanic agenda, you will still get sponsors. Talk less of God's agenda. And people will just prioritize money. Money is not it. In this kingdom, faith is our currency. Faith is our currency. 
He said, come and buy without money. He said it in Isaiah, come and buy without money. Then he said, how? And then he showed us how to buy. You can come in contact with grace, and you will not just have desire. When you come in contact with grace, thirst is what you use to, to draw. To draw. And guess what? You can draw with bucket. You can draw with the plastic. Some of us draw, drill with drums and tankers. I didn't come into ministry because of money. The money I'm looking for, the ministry doesn't have it. The only person that seems to have it is Nigeria. And I would have sought Nigeria many times before you know. That's what I'm telling you. you don't, they don't have an idea of what corruption looks like. The money I'm looking for, Nigeria, is the only one that seems to have it. They said one, one former governor of a bank. That's the, that's, the, that's the man who we should be sitting down and be talking. He almost stole the country. Sorry, he stole the country. Opened emptiness, vanity. To what end? To what end? Mm. Let me round this story up. <laughs> wow. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, I'm going to read verse 31 to 46. This is the concluding part of the parable of talent. Because the parable of talent is in the same 25. Okay? But from 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him. Now, this is the end of time. He said, when the Son of Man come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Please, who told this story? Who told this parable? Sorry, it's not a parable. It's a prophetic word that Jesus declared. That the time is coming. He said, all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and fed you, or thirsty, and gave you drink? Then when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Verse 39. Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. First thing I want you to pay attention to. Were these people surprised or not? Were they surprised or not? That's the one that caught my attention. Why? Why were they surprised? They did it without knowing who they were doing it to. In fact, while they were doing it, they were not sure what it translated to. You know, in that kingdom, there will be surprises. There will be surprises. The first will be the last, and the last will be the first. The person you don't expect to show up there. You will see the person, and the angels are the one who is carrying his chariot. And you, you are carrying your marwa. And because there will be mad there. He said, when, when did you see this thing happen? And then he said, you didn't know that you were actually doing to me. That were the righteous. Now, let's go further. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from you, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angel. See? So the fire was actually prepared for who? For the devil and his angel. God didn't prepare the hellfire for people. It was for devil and his angel. And by the way, there are some angels who have been bound with chains since January. January, I'm sorry, since Genesis chapter 5. The angels who came down and slept with men and women who left their first estate. The Bible says that they have been bound in chains 
few the time, devil, devil still has, at least, at least devil has opportunity and his angel to do all the things. These ones have been bound in chains since, since January, Genesis chapter 5. Okay, so the Bible says that they, it said, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Go on. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then, he will answer them, saying, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And this will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. On that last day, there will be separation, clear separation, the sheep and the goat, between God's people and people who are of Satan. And those who have placed their faith in God and people who have lived according to the principles of God to join him and expand his kingdom. Conversely, those whose motives were also selfish and self-centered and resisting his messiahship indirectly, who did not prioritize God's kingdom, they will not be accepted by him. Hmm. Both groups, the sheep and the goat, they were surprised by Jesus' judgment. The group that were rejected, believing that they did works that would please God, Jesus said he never knew them. Hmm. That the people who failed to understand what truly pleased Jesus or what truly pleased God, they focused on religious acts, they neglected the things of the Spirit, they neglected acts of kindness and benevolence, they refused to enter into the purpose and counsel of God for their lives. They, they, they refused to do ministry, expand the frontiers of God's kingdom. They did not meet God's expectation. They didn't realize that their good works, um, that their, their inactive, inactivity or inability or refusal to do God's work would count eventually against them. Those who were doing the work didn't also know that God was seeing it and God was recording it. Hmm. Maybe I should shock you. You are not okay just to be born again. You are not okay. To be born again is not okay. <laughs> born again is entry into the kingdom. There is a whole lot more that God expects from us. There's a whole lot more that God expects from us. At least, you should be able to bring one person to the kingdom. You should be able to show act of kindness that will make somebody repent and come to God. There are so many ways we can expand the frontiers of God's kingdom, and this is very, very important. We must help Jesus by serving other people and showing love for the things that matters to God. Ignorance will not be an excuse. They said we didn't know. They didn't say, okay, because you did not know, let's manage you. No. My advice, let me round it up. My advice. After you're born again, there is, a, there is more responsibility given to you. You have to do something. And that's why I'm asking you that you put your gift and your grace to work. That's number one. First of all, be born again. And after you're born again, you're a child. Now you are in God's kingdom. You, you have work to do. We have work to do. Some time ago, I saw people of the church of Satan in the U.S. preaching their gospel. No. You didn't get me. They were doing evangelism. Recorded evangelism. The way we go around and share, day two, we are marketing the church of Satan. There's work to do. Number two, discover your gifts and fulfill your purpose. Your purpose. Gifts and calling are not the same. Everyone is gifted. But your calling is what you use your gifts to accomplish or to fulfill. Something that your creator, you know, wants you to achieve for him. To what end is your gift if it's not to fulfill your calling? Your gift is not your calling unless it is directed towards your purpose or a purpose in God's kingdom. 
Gift will provide us with opportunities. Why calling will offer us destiny. It will offer us purpose. Gift in themselves are not fulfilling, okay? But purpose and calling does. Very important. Number three, sign up for mentorship. Look for someone who is doing something that you want to do. Things that God is leading you to do. Look for someone and ask them to guide you. Very, very important. Some people don't even know that their ministry will eventually be the one that will take care of them. Not the job. The ministry will eventually take care of some people. Just imagine what um, Ignatius eventually did with his life. At the end of the day, there were people who were giving, who were donating, who were making so much contribution. And the man just relaxed and they were doing and expanding the kingdom of God. I don't know, but I just imagine what would be what that man would get when he gets to heaven. Some of us are beneficiaries. Or maybe someone connected to you or someone who is related to you. Very, very important. I look forward to that day when somebody here will have schools. Uh -huh. Schools. Um, hospitals. Uh, initially, it can start with business. You know, I've been telling you this thing. Some people, after they've gotten the money, now they are spreading the money. Uh, after they made money in bank, they now started a foundation. Or they made money in manufacturing. They now started a foundation. And those foundations were just corporate social responsibility, not a ministry. They didn't think, they didn't see that it was actually a ministry. So please, look for people who are doing whatever you want to do and be coached, be trained, leverage. And then lastly, put that gift to work. Okay? Put the gift to work. It's okay to do what is in the place you know, what you're doing in the office now is okay to do it, but there is so much more that you can still do outside of that kingdom. I mean, outside of that work, that job that you're doing. So there's more to our life than what we think it is. If God gave 10 minus to each, believing, concluding that that's all that you need, then it makes sense that we start, we deploy our gift and express the supernatural lifting of God. The Bible says the Lord gave the word, and great was the company of them that proclaimed it. When you step out in faith, when you step out in faith, you'll be surprised how God will send you help, how God will show you ways, how God will show you path. I understand that the environment is limiting, the frustration, the economic situation, and all that, but see, we are of a different kingdom. <laughs> we are God's people. Okay, and you don't own this life anymore. He paid for your life. He ransomed you. So you, you don't live to yourself anymore. You live to his glory and for the fulfillment of his counsel for your life. I pray that you find destiny. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray that you fulfill the purpose of God. Amen. I pray that the investment of God in your life will not go to waste. I have told you before, Nigeria is not strong enough. The economy of Nigeria is not strong enough to foretell the purpose of God for your life. It's because uh, we, we haven't come to that consciousness. God had factored Nigeria into the equation. He had factored 2024. And the things that will happen in 2026, okay? They said dollar wrote to almost 2,000. Yeah, it, it was part of the equation. God saw it. <laughs> God saw it. Even if government did not see it, God saw it. And how long dollar will still rise or pounds will still rise, God saw it. He, he, those things are not limiting. They can't limit the plans and the purpose of God for your life. If we will find it, God will lift us. And that shall be your testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Can we bow our heads as we pray? Talk to God. Father, what is my purpose? I want to know it. If you require to go on a retreat just to find purpose, then go. Enough of this trial and error. Find purpose. What is it that God wants you to do? What he's asking for is return on investment. Even if it's ordinary interest. If you can't double it, if you can't do 50%, you can't do 60%, if you can't do 70%, the minimum he's asking is return on investment. And I can confidently tell you that if you find purpose and you step into it, even you, you'll be taken care of. You will be taken care of. God will arrange that people who cannot come into that space will partner 
And then you will become a blessing to the things that God is doing through you. There are children that need you. There are families that need you. There are men that need you. God's kingdom is about people. They are the extension of God. God will do anything to save man. God will do anything to bring people into his kingdom. The Bible says that he's not in a hurry to come because he's waiting, hoping that many people will still repent and come to the saving knowledge of God. And some will not come even when you preach to them. They may only come when we step into ministry. When our ministry touches them or reaches out to them or does something powerful in their lives. Lift your voices and talk to God this morning. Father, help us. What is our purpose, Lord? Reveal them to us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. I want to pray for somebody in this service. You can't even talk about purpose or destiny because you don't even have a relationship with your maker. You are not recognized on the platter, on the, on the platform. You don't exist. As far as God is concerned, you are spiritually dead because you don't have a relationship with him. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to start a relationship with the Father, then you are the one I'm talking about. You need to make a decision for him. You can't sit on the fence. And this is the day of salvation. If you want to make that decision, whether you're in this hall, you're connecting with us online, put one hand in your chest and leave the other hand as we pray. Put one hand in your chest and leave the other hand as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you want to make that decision, please say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask that you come into my heart. I accept you as Jesus, the Son of God. And he now Satan and his works. And I ask that you be my Lord and Savior. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, for your sons and daughters who are making this decision. We receive them in the beloved. And today we declare that they are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. They are filled with your life and with your light. And we declare grace flows into their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ. We declare, Holy Father, that your blessings will locate them. They will find you in every aspect and every area of their lives. And your glory will be seen at work in their lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.